I have received the following communication from Her Excellency the Governor-General. I desire to inform the House of Representatives that I have received a letter dated 24 November 2011 from Mr Harry Jenkins, MP, tendering his resignation as Speaker of the House of Representatives and that I have accepted his resignation. Accordingly, I invite the House to elect a new Speaker. The next business is the election of a Speaker. Mr Clark, I move that the member for Fisher, Peter Slipper, do take the chair of this House as Speaker. Mr Clark, I was first elected to this place on the 24th of March 1990, and I've had the opportunity to observe seven speakers during that time. I want to say something in the first instance about the immediate past speaker. I regard Mr Jenkins as having served with distinction in this House to himself, to himself and his party proud, and more importantly, doing his parliament proud. And I'm proud also to call him a friend. In relation to Mr Slipper, I moved uh, on the 28th of September 2010 his nomination as Deputy Speaker of this place, and he was successful in that nomination. Um, he has been Deputy Speaker since that time. If one goes to the parliamentary handbook, one will see that he is eminently qualified to occupy the position of Speaker. He's been on the Speaker's panel from the 18th of February 2008. He was Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Finance and Administration from the 21st of October 1998 to the 26th of October 2004. He was Acting Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister from the 14th of March 2002 to the 7th of October 2003. But I particularly want to talk about his service since he's been Deputy Speaker of this place on the 28th of September 1990, and I do it through the prism of having served on the Privileges Committee, having served on the Procedures Committee of this House, and having a strong love of the procedures of this place. He has impressed, because it has been a difficult position, but he hasn't been intimidated. He's acted with independence, with impartiality. He's incurred, I think, the wrath of some of those opposite with some of his actions because he has observed the rules of this place. So when one looks to who is to replace former Speaker Jenkins, one has to say who is best capable of keeping the House in order. I say, without hesitation, Mr Slipper, the member for Fisher, fits that bill. Fits it impeccably in terms of his service to this House. Now, I observed a press conference today that seemed to indicate that the opposition believes that the Speaker should come from the government side of the House, as if it was some convention, writ large. Well, let me say this to all members of the House. That's fine, but let's not rewrite history and let's not rewrite what those opposite have done. One of the first acts I took place in, in when I was first elected to this parliament was the election of the then Speaker for that parliament. We actually had an election. The Liberal Party actually nominated one of their own for Speaker, Mr Doby, who was defeated 79 to 67 on the 8th of May 1990. So the view of the Liberal Party at that stage was they felt that one of their own was better to be Speaker, and it became a matter for the House. So it wasn't an unopposed position. Now, was it an accident in 1990? No, it was repeated. On, and I'm arguing here why, why Mr Fisher himself qualifies for the position of Speaker, notwithstanding that he's not a member of this government. On the 4th of May 1993, there was another election where Mr Doby was again put up, and he, he was defeated by Speaker Martin, 78 to 63. So this notion, this recent invention that it has to come from members of the government is not what the opposition used to think. Now you've got to have a long memory in this game and fortunately, because I've got almost 22 years of experience in this place, I remember some events past 
And we've also got the honourable member for Barara, the father of the House, who knows it was usual in the early days for the opposition to put one of their own up. And I don't decry that. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm not going to stand here and allow it to be to allow it to be unchallenged that something is wrong because the speaker doesn't come from the governing party. So, Mr. Clark, I say to you that I believe in the time that Mr. Slipper has occupied the position of deputy speaker, he has shown that he is worthy of being elected to the position of speaker in the way he has run this place, and I believe he'll be a good independent speaker, which is what this House needs. Is the motion seconded? Seconded. Uh, I have the honour of seconding uh, this uh, uh, nomination of Mr Slipper. First of all, I would uh, like to uh, join the member for Banks in my sincere regret that uh, Mr Jenkins, the member for Scullin, is uh, leaving his position. I, I would like to restate that he's not just done uh, the parliament proud, he's done his party proud. Uh, and we have all, in this very difficult circumstances of a hung parliament, had uh, a man who I believe has uh, exercised his responsibilities with all the neutrality and uh, goodwill that he can. Now, anyone who's observed uh, Mr Slipper in the period uh, of this very difficult hung parliament as Deputy Speaker would have to say uh, whether uh, one knew him well beforehand or not that he has also exercised uh, that knowledge of procedure and fairness uh, to, to a, a very great extent. I think if uh, one observed his uh, knowledge of uh, standing orders and procedures. He is just as the member for Banks described him, a man who, with his uh, knowledge of procedure, uh, is perfectly fit for the role of Speaker. I have, uh, uh, as, we many, as many people in this House know, uh, when you're a parliamentarian you make unlikely friendships. Uh, there are uh, people on both sides of politics who be become knowledgeable of each other, and I've got to know Peter Slipper over uh, the last years. He and his uh, very charming wife, Inga, who I hope is here to uh, participate in this honour to him. Uh, I have observed a man who uh, has been attacked by his local media, but who in this parliament has behaved extremely honourably and well, has discharged his duties, and who um, despite his reputation uh, in the local uh, newspapers, which have seemed to me to have political axes to grind, uh, has a great affinity with human rights. He and I uh, have travelled together to India and into the uh, foothills of the Himalayas to meet His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Mr Slipper, uh, in the role of Speaker, will have to exercise a great deal of diplomatic um, dexterity, which I'm confident, uh, with his knowledge of international affairs, uh, with his knowledge of uh, people from overseas, uh, he will exercise, which is uh, with great, with great uh, uh, dexterity, as I said. This is a very important role for the speaker, as well as his behaviour in the House. Uh, Ms. Th I'm pleased to get all of the uh, the opposition. Uh, from across the, across the aisle. That's because they find the political circumstances of this nomination very uncomfortable, and I can understand that. Uh, I, have, I, I am not going to extend their discomfort by any further, but I have a great honour in nominating Mr Slipper, the member for Fisher, as the Speaker, and joining my good friend, the member for Banks, in that nomination. Does the honourable member for Fisher accept nomination? Uh, Mr. Clark, I accept the nomination. Yeah. Is there any further proposal? Mr. Clark, I move that the member for Chisholm take the House, uh, the chair of, of Speaker, yeah, yeah, as the yeah, chair, yeah. that the member for Chisholm do take the chair of this House as Speaker. 
Mr Clark, it is my honour to move the uh, nomination of the member for Chisholm, uh, because that is the orthodox political position of the Westminster parliamentary system. This is the first time, Mr Clark, this is the first time that a government has not nominated one of their own to be Speaker of this parliament. I heard the member for Banks trying to find some kind of uh, alibi for what he knows. It has been an extraordinary day in Australian politics, and I respect the member for Banks. And without reflecting on the member for Fisher, can I say that the member for Banks, the member for Melbourne Ports, and all members of this parliament with any experience know that this is utterly unprecedented for the government not to follow the Westminster tradition of nominating one of their own members to be Speaker of the Parliament. The member for Banks referred to precedents uh, in past years of members of the opposition who have been nominated for Speaker. But the point that he did not make is that on all of those occasions a member of the government was also nominated. And that on all of those occasions, the opposition couldn't possibly be successful in its nomination. And the tradition of the Westminster system has always been in this country yes. that a member of the government is nominated and a member of the opposition is nominated, and that the person who becomes second in those ballots usually takes the role as either deputy speaker or second deputy speaker. And my good friend, the member for Cook in those days, Mr. Doby, and I happened to be in the parliament in 1993. I've been here almost as long as the member for Banks, when he was nominated fully new and knew well that he would not be elected as Speaker. So this is the first time in this country that the government has decided to nominate a member of the opposition, and we all know why. I nominate the member for Chisholm today because the member for Chisholm is quite correctly a member of the government and should take the chair as Speaker. The member for Chisholm has been the Deputy Speaker before in this parliament, from 2008 to 2010. Since that time, since the government did not re-elect her as Deputy Speaker after the minority parliament began, she has served on the Speaker's panel. I have served with the member for Chisholm on parliamentary committees in this parliament for many years. The member for Chisholm is a member of integrity and a member of honesty who would fill the role of Speaker with absolute aplomb, and she deserves to be nominated by the government for Speaker, not by the opposition. But I will nominate her in the absence of the government following the Westminster traditions upon which this parliament is based. And can I say also, Mr Clark, that it, it does grieve me that the Speaker, Mr Jenkins, has retired today as Speaker of this parliament. I have had a topsy-turvy relationship with, the, mem with the, the member for Scullin over the period that I have been manager of opposition business, but I think he has always been fair and always been reasonable, and I have sometimes been known to say to him that if I was him, I would have thrown me out more often than he did. <laughs> but in, in praising the member for Scullin, can I say how disappointed I am on behalf of myself and the opposition? that he has chosen to retire prematurely. He should have, in my view, served out this term as Speaker whenever that finishes. He was doing the job as well as anybody could be expected to do in a minority parliament. I won't reflect on the reasons for his resignation. I accept the statement that he has made to the parliament today. Uh, and In doing so, I conclude my remarks and urge members of the House to support the member for Chisholm. Is the nomination seconded? Uh, Mr Clark, I second the nomination of the member for Chisholm. Order. Does the member for Chisholm accept nomination? Given that it was such a gracious occasion, I am loath to say I do not accept the nomination. Is there any further proposal? Mr Clark, I move that the member for Lyons do take the chair of this House as Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Clark, it does, I'm disappointed that the member for Chisholm has refused the nomination. 
she would have been assured of my support and the support of the opposition. And I believe she would have fulfilled the role uh, with all the uh, uh, capacity that she has brought to this parliament since she was elected. But in the absence of the member for Chisholm accepting nomination, it gives me great pleasure to nominate the member for Lyons as Speaker of this House. And I do so, Mr. Clark, I do so, Mr. Clark, because the conventions of this parliament are that a member of the government, the member of the government takes the role of speaker in our Westminster tradition. And member for Banks, the clerk will not entertain a point of order during these speeches. It's not and you shouldn't place him in that position, as you well know. And Mr Clark, as we know in this parliament, the Westminster tradition dictates in this country that a member of the government is nominated for and usually elected as Speaker. The member for Lyons has served in this parliament since 1993. He was elected in the same election as I was elected in 1993, and he has been re-elected on many occasions since that time. He has been uh, a, a member of the Speaker's panel of this place since 1996. For 15 years he has been a member of the Speaker's panel of this place, and of course, in the Tasmanian State Parliament, he was the Chairman of Committees and Deputy Speaker from 1980 to 1981, and as a former member, of course, of the Tasmanian House of Assembly from 1979 to 1982. He has served as Chairman and Deputy Chairman of many parliamentary committees. He is eminently qualified to fulfil the role of Speaker in this Parliament, and. I'm almost, I'm almost trepidatious in nominating the member for Lyons, knowing how he would like to deal with the opposition if he so took the role of Speaker in this parliament. But I know that if he fulfilled the role, he would do so fairly and reasonably. And I know, most importantly, his number one qualification, Mr Clark, for Speaker of this parliament is that he comes from the government. And everyone in this parliament knows that the Westminster tradition in this country has been that the government nominates the Speaker and the government fills the role of Speaker, and that's as it should be, and that is why I nominate the member for Lyons. Is the nomination seconded? I second the nomination of the member for Lyons. Uh, Mr. Clark. Um, uh, no, I, I uh, decline uh, the nomination, uh, Mr. Clark. A, is there any further proposal? <laughs> Mr. Clark, I move that the member for Braddon do take the chair of this house as speaker. Mr Clark, surely there is one member of the Labor Party who regards himself as worthy to take the chair as Speaker of this Parliament. Surely there is one member of the Labor Party who believes they could fill the role of Speaker in this minority Parliament. Is there no one in the Labor Party who believes that they would be capable of filling the role of Speaker in this Parliament? And I nominate the member for Braddon, another member, another member of the Speaker's panel, who would fill the role of Speaker eminently well. I know his view of the opposition, but I put it to him, does he have the courage of his own convictions? Does he believe that he could only be a member of the Speaker's panel, or does he truly believe that he should take the great office of Speaker of this parliament and maintain the Westminster tradition which has been established in this place for 110 years? Is the nomination seconded? It gives me great pleasure to second the nomination of the member for Braddon. Does the member accept the nomination? Mr. S I decline the invitation. Thank you. Is there any further proposal? Order! 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 Mr Clark, I move that the member for Cunningham do take the chair of this House as Speaker. Mr Clark, the member for Cunningham has been a member of the Speaker's panel since the 18th of February 2008. 
and I would put it to her that she is eminently worthy to fulfil the role of Speaker of this Parliament. And I would put it to her, as I did to the member for Braddon, surely she believes that she has the capacity to be the, be the Speaker of this minority Parliament. Surely her colleagues would share the confidence that the opposition does that the member for Cunningham can fulfil the role of Speaker of this Parliament. And again I state, for the record, Mr Clark, that the number one qualification of the member for Cunningham to fulfil the role of Speaker of this Parliament is that she is a member of the government. And if the government truly believes in this Parliament and in the Westminster traditions upon which it is based, they would not be trashing the Constitution, trashing the standing orders, trashing the conventions of this Parliament for 110 years and not nominating a member of their own side to take the role of Speaker of this Parliament. So I put it to the member for Cunningham, take the role of Speaker of the Parliament and do the job that we know you are capable of doing and that you should have the confidence that you are capable of doing. Is the nomination seconded? I second the uh, member for Cunningham. Does the member accept nomination? Okay. Is there any further proposal? Mr Clark, I, no I move that the member for Capricornia do take the chair of this House as Speaker. Mr Clark, this is an extraordinary day in the Australian parliamentary system when the opposition is forced to move that members of the government take the role as Speaker of this Parliament because the government would instead uh, trash the traditions of this place by electing a member of the opposition. And I don't wish to reflect on the member for Fisher by nominating other members, in this case the member for Capricornia. What I am trying to say to the parliament and to the people is that surely the Labor Party believes that there is one of their number who has the ability and the honour and the integrity to accept the role as Speaker of this parliament. The member for Capricornia has been a member of the Speaker's panel since the 20th of October 2010. She's fulfilled that role uh, with integrity and ability. And I would put it to her that the opposition will support the member for Capricornia should she accept the nomination and take the role as Speaker of this Parliament, which, as I've said before and I'll say again for the record, the Westminster tradition of this Parliament dictates that the government fulfil the role of Speaker of this Parliament and nominate one of their own. In the absence of the government uh, having the, the courage uh, and the political uh, acumen to fulfil the role that they should of upholding the Westminster traditions, it falls to the opposition to do so, and I move that the member for Capricornia take the role as Speaker of this Parliament. Is the motion seconded? I second the nomination of the member for Capricornia. Does the member accept the nomination? Thank you, Mr Clark. No, I don't. Is there any further proposal? Mr Clark, I move that the member for Hindmarsh do take the chair of this House as Speaker. Mr Clark, it's been my privilege to know the member for Hindmarsh as a fellow South Australian since he was elected to this place. He attempted on numerous occasions to be elected as the member for Hindmarsh and was finally successful on his third try. Since that time, he's been a member of the Speaker's panel in this parliament, and he's fulfilled the role with all the ability he's been able to muster to do the job as well as he can. Mr. Speaker, you, Mr. Clark, you would assume that the member for Hindmarsh would have the confidence in his own ability to accept the nomination to be Speaker of this parliament to take the chair. And I know in his heart of hearts he is well aware that he would be capable of being Speaker of this Parliament, and I'd be very proud to have a fellow South Australian sit in the chair and preside over the House. In fact, Mr. Mr. Clark, it would be the most unusual event if the member for Hindmarsh wasn't to take the role as Speaker of this Parliament, because it would be the first time in this country's history that the government did not support one of their own to be chair, to be Speaker of this Parliament. And today will mark the day in Australia's history that the Westminster tradition was overturned in this country by the Labor Party simply because the Labor Party always puts political interests ahead of what is good for the parliament and for the country. Yeah. Political interests have determined the day's proceedings by the Labor Party. 
But I tell you what, Mr Clark, the, the Labor Party will come to rue this day. They will come to rue the precedent that they have created. And I would urge the member for Hindmarsh to recognise the very serious act of, of vandalism that the Labor Party is visiting on this parliament and on our, on our conventions and seriously consider accepting the nomination of the opposition to take the chair as Speaker of this House. Is the motion seconded? I second the nomination of the member for Hindmarsh. Does the member accept the nomination? Uh, I'm sorry to disappoint the uh, member for Sturt, but I decline. Order, order. Is there any further proposal? Mr Clark, I move that the member for Reid do take the chair of this House as Speaker. Mr Clark, the member for Reid has been a member of the Speaker's panel from the, since the 20th of October 2010, and he has been in this parliament first as the member for Lowe since 1998 and now as the member for Reid following a redistribution in New South Wales in 2010. But the member for Reid is well known to this side of the parliament for his integrity and for his honesty and for his intention to always uphold the values and principles upon which he came into the parliament. I know that the member for Reid, member for Reid on many occasions agrees with positions the opposition has taken, particularly on life issues uh, over the course of the time that he has been in the parliament. And I know that the member for Reid, the member for Reid would be truly disappointed and surprised and probably quite hurt with the way that the Labor Party has today decided to traduce the Westminster traditions of this parliament. And I know that the member for Reid would have a very high regard for the member for Chisholm. And I know that the member for Reid would be one of the people who would have been urging the Labor Party upon the retirement of Speaker Jenkins to support the member for Chisholm to be Speaker in this place. But in the absence of the member for Chisholm accepting the nomination of the opposition, I think it does fall to the member for Reid to search inside himself and recognise that today's act by the Labor Party, this unprecedented act, will ring as a day of infamy in this parliament. And therefore, the member for Reid, to protect the traditions of this parliament, to protect the Westminster system upon which our democracy relies, should recognise his own ability to take the role as Speaker of the, of the parliament and accept the nomination of the opposition that I move with pride today. Is the motion seconded? I second the nomination of the member for Reid. Does the member accept the nomination? I thank the, uh, the member for Sturt, but I've never confused ambition with ability, and it's my melancholy duty to decline the nomination. <laughs> Is there any further proposal? <laughs> Mr Clark. I move that the member for Corwell do take the chair of this House as Speaker. Mr Clark, the member for Corwell and I haven't always agreed on every issue. I think it's fair to say, uh, particularly on issues to do with the Middle East. But I know that if the member for Corwell was prepared to recognise her own ability and understand that she could be the Speaker of this place, that she would accept the nomination of the opposition to take the chair of this House as Speaker. The member for Corwell is another member of the Labor Party who serves on the Speaker's panel and has in this minority parliament. And you would assume, Mr Clark, that every member of the Speaker's panel who is a member of the Labor Party would recognise that they, they were worthy enough to be members of the Speaker's panel and thereby to be one day Speaker of this parliament. Is there no one, Mr Clark, in the Labor Party who believes that they have the ability or the honour to take the role as Speaker of this Parliament. And I would appeal to the member for Corwell, who has been in this Parliament since 2001 for 10 years, to recognise that by accepting this nomination today, by accepting the role as Speaker of the Parliament, that she would be supporting the traditions of this place that she has vowed to uphold before. She has given many speeches in this place, Mr Clark, as has the member for Chisholm, the member for Reid, the member for Hindmarsh, the member for Capricornia, the member for Lyons, about the importance of the Westminster tradition, the importance of the parliamentary system, the importance of democracy to this place. Fine words, Mr Clark, 
but today is the day to back them with action, not just to come into this place with syrupy words and drop those words into the Hansard and then not back them with action when they are put to the test. And I am putting all these members to the test today, Mr Clark, and I put the member for Cornwall to the test today and ask her, will she back her good intentions with the actions to support the traditions of this parliament? Is the motion seconded? I second the nomination of the member for Caldwell. Does the member accept nomination? Uh, Mr Clark, honour and integrity I have very much, but I decline the member for Sturt's nomination. Is there any further proposal? No, It, it may be the only way we'll shut him up. <laughs> Is there any further proposal? Mr Clark, I move that the member for Petrie do take the chair of this House as Speaker. And in doing so, Mr Clark, can I just say that the nomination by the member for New England unfortunately underlines what high farce this parliament has become. The member for New England's, the member for New England's attempt at humour underlines what high farce the, the Labor Party has brought this parliament to. And far from being amused by the member for New England's action, all the members of the Labor Party who have signed up to this deal today should hang their heads in shame that the, parliament, that the parliament has become such high farce that here in Canberra, inside the Beltway, the Labor Party thinks it is amusing to trash the traditions of the Westminster system in this country. That the Labor Party thinks it is fun. The Labor Party thinks it is amusing to entertain the nomination of myself as the Speaker of this parliament as a member of the opposition when the whole point of this debate today is that a member of the government should take the role of Speaker of the Parliament in the Westminster system. And it's no surprise that that nomination wasn't seconded, because nobody else was silly enough, quite frankly, Mr Clark, to second a motion of a member of the opposition to take the role as Speaker, except the member for Banks and the member for Melbourne Ports, who have done just that today. And their, their parliamentary careers will be remembered. Mr Clark, by the fact that they took part in this grubby action today. They took part in it, and I had more respect for them than they've demonstrated today. And in nominating the member for Petrie, Mr, Mr Clark, who has been on the Speaker's panel since the 20th of October 2010 and was elected in 2007, I hope that she, at least one member of the Labor Party, can I find one member of the Labor Party who believes in themselves enough to uphold the traditions of the Westminster system and take the role as Speaker of this Parliament. Is the proposal seconded? I second the nomination of the member for Petrie. Does the member accept the nomination? I decline the nomination by the member for Stan. <coughs> Is there any further proposal? Time for proposals has expired. I declare that the honourable member proposed, Mr Slipper, has been elected as Speaker. Yeah. Yeah.
Honourable members, I wish to express my grateful thanks for the high honour the House has been pleased to confer upon me. I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and on indulgence I would seek to make some remarks about the former Speaker, Harry Jenkins, and also to you. Mr Speaker, can I quote in this parliament the words of Winston Churchill, who once described himself in the following terms, I am a child of the House of Commons. I was brought up in my father's house to believe in democracy. Those words could well have been written by uh, anyone about Harry Jenkins. He certainly is a child of his father's house, a very distinguished speaker in this parliament. And he certainly is a child of this House as well, having served as a very distinguished speaker in some remarkable days. Harry Jenkins has served as Speaker of this Parliament when Kevin Rudd delivered the historic apology to the stolen generations. He served as Speaker in this Parliament during the days of some of the sharpest contests and most difficult debates that our nation needs to have about its future. He served in this parliament as the parliament's face to the world as we have welcomed leaders around the world, most recently President Obama and before President Obama, Her Majesty the Queen. On all occasions, Harry Jenkins, as Speaker of this House, has carried out his duty with honour, with dignity, with a strict non-partisan approach which brought him credit from all sides of the parliament. Mr. Mr. Mr Speaker, I would say to uh, Harry Jenkins, perhaps the only flaw in his speakership was identified today by the member for Sturt. I would have taken the advice and thrown the member for Sturt out on more occasions. But with that small, uh, small uh, words of uh, chiding, uh, the, uh, the former Speaker, Harry Jenkins, has served this parliament well. He is a child of this House. He is someone who learnt a love of democracy in his family home, but he is also a child of the Labor Party, grew up in a Labor home, grew up with Labor values, has witnessed for those values all of his adult life as he has served his constituents in the seat of Scullin. And Harry Jenkins, as the member for Scullin, has decided that it is time to return back home, back into the active service of the Labor Party, and we welcome him back into the Labor family in a very warm embrace. And we look forward to working alongside him in 2012. A great speaker, a great Labor Party man, and a great friend to all of us on this side of the Parliament. Mr. Speaker, can I say to you? Uh, the only difficulty you face, I think, is stepping into the shoes of a man so distinguished. Perhaps I should have joked slippers, but stepping into the shoes <laughs> of a man so distinguished. Mr Speaker, we anticipate that you will, as Speaker, guide this parliament in the way that you have guided it in the chair as Deputy Speaker. We have seen you, when you have exercised the role of Deputy Speaker, show a fierce sense of balance and appropriateness in this parliament. You've had the courage to take some difficult actions when they've been called upon to maintain order in the House. I'm sure we will continue to see that from you as you step now into the position of Speaker. And for the government side of this parliament, we will provide you the support required as you carry out the duties of Speaker. I thank the Honourable the Prime Minister. I call the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. And, Mr Speaker, I rise, uh, like the Prime Minister, to uh, speak in praise uh, of the former Speaker and to acknowledge your elevation to uh, high office. I say uh, very genuinely, Mr Speaker, that uh, Speaker Jenkins was an adornment to that high office. Uh, Speaker Jenkins was a friend of the parliament. Speaker Jenkins was an admirer and an upholder of the best traditions of this parliament, and I have to say that he will be much missed uh, as he leaves the chair. Uh, he has been, in my judgment, one of the very best speakers uh, to grace the chair of this parliament. Uh, certainly he is the equal of the best of the speakers that I have uh, served under in my 18 years in this chamber. As the Prime Minister has said, 
just a few moments ago a really outstanding speaker with a really strong love of the parliament, which begs the question, why has Speaker Jenkins left the chair? It begs the question, just why has this great man with a great love of this chamber and a great love of its traditions left the chair? Now, I, expect, I, I respect the observations that the speaker made himself from the chair this morning. He has left the chair because he wants to more fully participate in the councils of the Labor Party. He wants to more fully participate uh, in the life of his Labor colleagues. And doesn't that look to be the case, Mr Speaker, as he sits in that rather lonely position uh, close uh, to the gangway? Doesn't that look to be exactly uh, what has happened, that he has gone to rejoin uh, his comrades? Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I think that uh, probably the loneliest man in this parliament right now is our former speaker. But I say this, I say this of our former speaker. Our former speaker was born and bred in the Labor Party. And if there is one institution which he loves as much as he loves this parliament, it is in fact the Labor Party. And I know that as a very loyal son of the Labor Party, he would have accepted uh, the dictation uh, of his Labor superiors with a very heavy heart. That is what he would have done. He would have accepted it with a very heavy heart. And I have to say, and I have to say, uh, as a man who is also a creature of party and lover of party, I respect him all the more for doing it. Uh, you leave the great chair of this parliament, member for Scullin, uh, with our respect, with our affection and with our best wishes uh, for your future inside the parliament and outside the parliament. Yeah. Mr Speaker, what has happened today in this parliament is extraordinary and it is unprecedented, absolutely extraordinary and unprecedented. And in the end, Mr Speaker, this is about the judgment of one person, the person sitting opposite, uh, the person who is the prime minister of this country. This is happening because she has made the judgment that the government needs to shore up its numbers in this place. That's why this is happening. She wanted the former Speaker gone to shore up his, her position in this parliament, and she should be judged accordingly. This is the Prime Minister's decision. Sure, uh, it has just been ratified by the parliament, as it inevitably, as it inevitably was going to be, but this is her decision, her judgment, uh, and she will stand or fall on this judgment. Mr Speaker, may I say uh, we have known each other uh, for many years. Uh, we have known each other uh, for many years. Uh, we have shared good times and not so good times. Uh, you have been an extremely effective and efficient uh, Deputy Speaker of this parliament. Uh, you certainly have the technical skills and the knowledge uh, of this parliament uh, to be effective in this chair. Uh, we congratulate you, uh, we wish you well, and we express uh, the, the hope uh, and the confidence that you will serve without fear or favour. I um, thank the leader. I call the honourable member for line. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And very briefly, on behalf, I think, of the crossbenchers, although uh, the member for Melbourne may say some short words, uh, just also to uh, acknowledge the service of the former Speaker uh, for everyone who was here at 3am to see Section 88 pulled out uh, at an ungodly hour was one for the purists and uh, an example of uh, the technical skills of uh, 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 the former Speaker as well as um, the personality of the man. I was recently on a Q&A panel on ABC with William McInnes, who I think did a better uh, uh, interpretation of Harry Jenkins than anyone in this chamber could do. Uh, and quite often we look at personality in regards to the role. Uh, however, it is those technical skills that make the job. Uh, and over the past year, in what has been a challenging parliament, those technical skills have been on full display and are the mark uh, of the man. Uh, I think as far as events of today are concerned, 
Uh, we're all counting numbers. We're all wondering exactly what did happen uh, overnight. Uh, I'm assured it's a voluntary move uh, that no one has. But well, <laughs> it's your first job. <laughs> Who gave me that assurance is the former speaker. So, in consultation with him, but uh, I do say we are all watching closely. It does change numbers. It does change change di dynamics. And there are still issues uh, such as private health insurance, such as poker machines, and a whole range of issues that we, as a parliament, do uh, need to deal with throughout 2012. And I would hope agreements uh, that are currently in place remain in place, and that this is a parliament that does want to do reform. Uh, for the future. In regards to uh, the uh, speaker in the chair now, uh, based on latest mail, I not only welcome an independent speaker in the chair, I gather I also welcome a new independent member in this parliament, uh, and I congratulate you on the role uh, that you are taking on and wish you all the best uh, in uh, uh, sticking to the standing orders and making this as an objective place as possible. I call the honourable member for Melbourne. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Having been dobbed in by the member for Lyon, just very briefly on behalf of the Australian Greens, we'd like to also acknowledge the uh, what I think has been extraordinary work in a very um, uh, interesting and novel parliament from the member for Scullin, and to welcome you to the chair, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for Melbourne. Uh, I call the Honourable the Leader of the Nationals. Well, Mr Speaker, may I also congratulate you on your election to office. Uh, you are and always have been in this parliament my electoral, electorate neighbour, and I wish you well in the high office in, in, for where, which you have now been elected to. You follow uh, Mr Jenkins into uh, this uh, position. Uh, Mr Jenkins has been a remarkable speaker. I certainly hold him in the highest regard. He's held the office of Speaker in perhaps the most difficult and challenging of all parliaments, one where neither he uh, nor the government could be absolutely assured of their numbers. They didn't lose too often, but never could absolutely be, be assured of the numbers. But he carried the responsibilities of the office and, added to, uh, and really added to the parliament because of, of his own manner and the way in which he, he held the office. He demonstrated always good humour, good tolerance and, and wise judgment. In a sense, he was born to be Speaker and he fulfilled every possible um, expectation that I'm sure his family, his party and indeed this parliament uh, could have expected of him. Uh, he's, he gained, in my view, his great authority in the chair because of his superlative understanding of the standing orders and uh, his, the, accuracy, the accuracy of his orders. Now, we may not have always been um, in agreement with them, but he always had an arguable case. And uh, I think that it was his, his uh, superior understanding of the standing orders that gave him such authority in the parliament and, and why he rightly deserves to be numbered amongst the very greatest of speakers that our parliament has known. So uh, I think that uh, for you, Mr Speaker, it's a, almost uh, an impossible task to follow your predecessor. Uh, we respect the office and we wish you well in the position you hold. I thank the leader. I call the Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I have been advised that the Governor-General will set a time for receiving you as Speaker of the House. I thank the Prime Minister. The next business is the election of Deputy Speaker. I call the honourable member for Holt. Thank you very much, and I'd just like to start by adding my congratulations to your elevation on the chair. I'd like to move that the honourable member for Chisholm, Ms. Anna Elizabeth Burke, be elected deputy speaker. I am delighted to nominate Anna as deputy speaker of this house. Anna was previously deputy speaker in this place between the 12th of February 2008 and the 28th of September 2010. Anna served in this role with great distinction, great tolerance and great dignity. Now, Anna was first elected as the federal member for Chisholm at the 1998 election. Her electorate knows that Anna is an incredibly hard-working, diligent and tenacious member of parliament 
and I know her electorate will be pleased that she's again been nominated as Deputy Speaker. Anno's motto on her website is, I'm here to help, and she believes and has demonstrated that she does everything she can to assist members of the local community, no matter how large or small their problems or their concerns. One of the distinguishing features about Anna is that she is a highly successful campaigner and advocate. For instance, in 2005, she played a major role in this place in protecting people from unwanted telemarketing calls by moving a private member's bill in federal parliament to create a do national do not call list, which pressured the former government into adopting her policy. In recent times, Anna has campaigned against human trafficking. Anna has become a leader on this important issue. Between 500,000 and 4 million people are trafficked internationally each year. In recent weeks, she has met with various groups in her electorate to discuss the Don't Trade Lives campaign. For me, it's always been great to see Anna's passion and commitment when she takes on an issue like this and that which concerns many Australians. She's also been active in several other local and national campaigns and has been widely praised for her efforts to raise awareness of anaphylaxis and eating disorders. Currently, Anna is chair of the Privileges and Members' Interest Committee, in which she has presented the draft code of conduct for members of parliament discussion paper November 2011, which was tabled in the House yesterday. In addition, she also sits on the Standing Committee of Climate Change, Environment and the Arts, and the Standing Committee on Petitions, and she's on the speaker's panel. It's been a great honour, and is a great honour, Anna, to work with you. You are respected for your passion, your dedication and your hard work, all of the skills that I know that you'll bring to bear in your role as Deputy Speaker. I am, and it is a great honour, Anna, for me to nominate you as Deputy Speaker, and I wish you every success in this position. Is the uh, nomination seconded? Uh, I call the honourable member for Bendigo. To endorse the words of the uh, member for Pine in seconding uh, this nomination for the member for Chisholm for Deputy Speaker. Before I do that, I'd also like to indicate my respect for retiring Speaker Harry Jenkins. I think he's been uh, a great speaker for this place. He served the role with great dis distinction, and uh, of course, we all know that's the family tradition. And uh, I'll give him my best wishes. <coughs> I think the member for Chisholm will make an outstanding deputy speaker. I've served in this parliament with her for all, all, just over 13 years now. She's always been a woman of considerable integrity, uh, sound judgment, and good humour. And uh, I think uh, the Speaker's panel will be well served by such a person as Anna in that particular job, and I have no hesitation in uh, making that recommendation. I thank the honourable member. Um, is there any further motion? I call the honourable member for Sturt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And in nominating the member for Maranoa as uh, deputy speaker of the Parliament, can I congratulate you in uh, your elevation to the office of Speaker? Mr. Speaker, I nominate uh, the member for Maranoa as Deputy Speaker, and it, it strikes me as passing strange that the member for Chisholm would be nominated for Deputy Speaker when, in fact, she didn't regard herself as being worthy to be the Speaker of the Parliament, but regards herself as being qualified to be the Deputy Speaker of the Parliament. The only reason I nominate the member for Maranoa is in order to display any consistency you would expect that the member for Chisholm would not be able to take the role as Deputy Speaker if she wasn't capable of being the Speaker of the Parliament. And so I nominate the member for Maranoa for that reason and also because the member for Maranoa is exactly the kind of person who should fill the role of Deputy Speaker in this Parliament. The member for Maranoa has been on the Speaker's panel for almost 10 years. He was a minister for five years and he was a minister assisting the Minister for Defence for three years. And in fact, he has been the second Deputy Speaker since the 12th of February 2008. I think all members of the parliament would agree with me that the member for Maranoa has served in the role as second deputy speaker and as minister, as chairman of parliamentary committees, as deputy chairman of parliamentary committees, and as the member for Maranoa for 21 years with distinction and ability and integrity. And I know that if the parliament has the confidence uh, and the sense to elect a, a member who wishes to be deputy speaker, and has the ability and the, and the intention to back their, their uh, worthiness for that role, then in fact he will fulfil the role uh, with great ability. And it would surprise me if the Parliament, uh, if the Labor Party elected the member for Chisholm as the Deputy Speaker, when the member for Chisholm has already indicated to the Parliament that she doesn't believe she's capable of being the Speaker. 
And so I'd ask the parliament to elect the member for Maranoa as the deputy speaker, and if he should be elected, I wish him the best in that role. Is the motion seconded? I call the honourable member for Cowper. I second the nomination of the member for Maranoa. <laughs> Are there any other motions? The time for motions has expired. In accordance with Standing Order 14, the bells will be rung and a ballot taken. Four minutes.
We're going order the four-minute uh, period um, uh, has expired. Um, uh, I understand the doors are going to be closed but not locked. Uh, ballot papers will now be distributed. I remind honourable members that this ballot is for the election of Deputy Speaker. Uh, honourable members should write only the name of the candidate they are supporting on the ballot paper, and the candidate um, obviously who has the greater number, who has the greater number of votes uh, shall be the Deputy Speaker. We have two candidates. Uh, we've got Ms Burke, uh, the honourable member for Chisholm, and we have Mr Scott, the honourable member for Maranoa. Ballot papers uh, will be distributed, and honourable members uh, ought to write uh, the name of the candidate they are supporting uh, on the ballot paper. Yeah, my son is.
um, the Leader of the House. Point of order, Mr Speaker. Um, it is apparent that one member of the House did not vote. This was a process whereby uh, the ballot was called open, the ballot closed. If members of the House of Representatives do not know how to vote, then it is, the, it is, it is unreasonable that if an ordinary citizen turns up at an electoral polling booth at five past six, they don't get they don't get to just put by hand a ballot paper to the returning officer. There was a process before the House. People were given ballot papers. They got to write their name on the ballot paper. They then got to put it in a box. In a box, Mr. Speaker. Um, no, I don't think this. I don't think this is necessary. Um, uh, after consulting the clerk. Uh, because only one ballot paper was distributed to each member of this House, uh, it's my ruling that the ballot paper from the Honourable Member for Bowman will be received. Order. 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 I, I do want to advise honourable members that it will be my intention uh, not to give warnings prior to sending people out under Standing Order 94A, although I would usually expect to give a warning prior to a naming. Usually. Usually. Uh, order. The result of the ballot is Ms Burke, 72 votes, Mr Scott, 71 votes. Uh, therefore, Ms Burke is elected Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives. Uh, I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And, uh, turning to another topic on indulgence, if I may. With your uh, indulgence, uh, well, firstly, Mr Speaker, if I could uh, congratulate the uh, if I could congratulate Anna Burke on her election as Deputy yeah, yeah, Speaker. Yeah. Uh, we all know what a fantastic job she did on the last occasion, and I know she will do a fantastic job on this occasion too. Order. Uh, Order. Order. But, Order. But, Ms. but Mr Speaker, I did, uh, I did want to indicate to the House that de dealing with a uh, separate topic and something that I know uh, is of concern to you and is of concern to Ms Burke, I did want to acknowledge the sad news that we've received this morning of the death of Maureen Larkham. Uh, members will remember Maureen as chief attendant in the main committee. Uh, one of the reasons I looked over at, uh, at the deputy speaker is uh, she's presided there on many, many occasions. 
and the parliamentary assistance, obviously, from around the parliament will remember Maureen very friendly, very, very uh, honourably. She was uh, a friendly person. She was valued as a mentor to many of them and has played a role in assisting them with starting their careers in this place. Our thoughts are with her husband, Jeff, her children and her grandchildren today. And I want to particularly say on behalf of all members of the House to all of our attendants, and we've seen the attendants with us just then uh, pursuing their duties in this parliament, that we're very, very sorry to hear this news of loss and we are grieving with them. I hope we all are very much focused on this loss and also on the uh, circumstances of her family at this time. I'm sure that um, all honourable members would associate themselves with the remarks of the honourable the Prime Minister, the leader of the Leader of the Opposition on Indulgence. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Look, I, I do wish to add briefly to the remarks of the Prime Minister. It is a sad thing uh, to lose a, a member of the parliamentary family, and uh, Maureen Larkham was indeed a member of the parliamentary family, not a member of parliament, but one of those people who make the parliament work. Uh, Maureen was legendary as someone of kindness, of gentleness, of decency uh, in a parliament which isn't always kind or gentle or decent. Uh, she stood for all the things that we like to think characterise the people of our country uh, whose welfare we try to advance uh, in this parliament. Uh, I should uh, particularly note, Mr Speaker, uh, that Maureen was very close uh, to one of my own staff members, uh, Di Honan. Uh, Maureen recently attended uh, Di's wedding and uh, Di, I know, has been particularly affected uh, by Maureen's uh, passing. Uh, Mr Speaker, our thoughts are with her family, her husband Jeff, her children Rebecca and Stephen, uh, the rugby international, uh, and her grandchildren. She will be missed. I thank the Leader of the Opposition. Before uh, we move on, I was just wondering if the Honourable Member for Chisholm wished to make some remarks on indulgence following her election as Deputy Speaker. The Honourable Member for Chisholm on indulgence. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, on indulgence, I'll be very quick because I really haven't had time to think about this given the uh, magnitude and the quickness of what transpired this morning. I actually just want to put on the record my gratitude and thanks to the former Speaker, Harry Jenkins. Um, I learned a great deal under him in the previous parliament. And it was an honour to serve with him. And I would like to remind the opposition that the Westminster tradition is very robust and there are many parliaments that do not actually have a speaker from the government presiding over them at this time. You only need to look at many of our state parliaments to understand the Westminster tradition uh, extends to democracy that turns up many variations of parliaments. I am deeply honoured to be doing this role and I look forward to working with everybody in the House. Uh, prior to moving to question time, I'd like to say just a few remarks uh, on my election as Speaker of the House of Representatives. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank my nominators, the Honourable Member for Banks uh, and uh, the Honourable Member for Melbourne Port, Ports. I'd also like to thank the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition uh, for their very kind remarks uh, and also the Honourable Member for Lyne and the Honour Honourable Member for uh, Melbourne. Uh, it is a great honour to be elected unopposed as the presiding officer of the House of Representatives. I'd also like to place on record uh, my tribute to uh, former uh, speaker, the former speaker, the honourable member for Scullin. Uh, I first served in this house uh, when his father, Dr Harry Jenkins, uh, was speaker. And uh, I must say that uh, uh, I had a very high regard for Dr Harry and I have an equally high regard for uh, the former speaker with whom I worked uh, very successfully as deputy speaker uh, following my election after the last poll. Uh, I saw um, the honourable member for Scullin smile when I mentioned his father because when I was first elected as a member of this place uh, I was a member of what they used to call Cocky's Corner, uh, that is the National Party. And uh, we used to sit uh, approximately where uh, the Honourable Member for Denison uh, and the Honourable Member for Lyon are currently sitting. I don't know what that means. Uh, but uh, 
Uh, I was uh, very vocal uh, and I was regularly warned uh, uh, by the Honourable Member for Scullin, and I never knew how he fully recognised that it was I who was interjecting. And as I mentioned when I was elected as Deputy Speaker, it turned out that Mrs Wendy Jenkins, uh, Harry's, uh, uh, Harry's uh, mother and uh, Dr Harry's wife, uh, used to sit in the Speaker's gallery and apparently point me out as the person <laughs> who indeed was the offender. Uh, look, uh, I must say that uh, during the time I've been in this parliament, I've been ejected from the House on five occasions, uh, uh, not as often, as co of course, as the, uh, the honor the, as the Leader of the House, I think 34 <laughs> times, uh, or the member for um, Sturt, uh, 32 times, uh, the uh, Honourable Member for Dixon, uh, I, I don't know whether he's looking to add to his 18 times, uh, but uh, I think this is a robust place uh, and uh, I would like to, uh, to see members uh, be as well behaved uh, as possible. I am not offended by the fact that uh, my, my friend, the Honourable Member for Sturt, uh, saw fit to nominate numerous other people. I have a very high regard uh, for his ability and I'm looking forward to working with uh, all members of the House uh, regardless of where they stand. Um, I do intend uh, to be an independent speaker in the Westminster tradition and I hope that this is establishing a principle which will be followed by speakers in other parliaments. I'm doing this uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, I strongly believe uh, that the Speaker ought to be independent in this parliament uh, by the Speaker not attending party rooms, uh, party room meetings and the Deputy Speaker following a similar practice. I think we've moved a long way towards an independent Speaker but I uh, truly uh, hope to be, well I, in fact I will be, uh, an independent Speaker in the Westminster tradition. And I noticed that on four occasions, uh, in September 2010, uh, the Leader of the Opposition said that that was his preference as far as a model for speakership is concerned. Uh, consequently, after, um, after 17 years membership of the National Party, uh, 19 years membership of the Liberal Party and three years uh, membership of the Liberal National Party, uh, I will be relinquishing uh, my party membership. Uh, I, I must say, I must say uh, that I've been encouraged in this opportunity to serve the parliament in a new way uh, by the actions uh, of some people in the Liberal National Party in recent times. I will endeavour, as I did as Deputy Speaker, to discharge my duty as Speaker in a non-partisan uh, manner. Frankly, I've got to admit that I'm not perfect and I've made some mistakes as some of the colourful stories about me reveal but I pledge to serve the parliament and the institution and its members to the best of my capacity. I would like to thank my wife Inga, my children, uh, Nicholas and Alexandra. I'd like to thank my staff. Uh, I'd also like to thank colleagues on both sides of the house for their support over my 21 year service as a member of the Australian parliament. It's a very great privilege uh, to serve in this parliament representing the electorate of Fisher on the Sunshine Coast and I'm looking forward to continuing uh, to serve that electorate in the future. I would just like to conclude by saying uh, that my door will always be open uh, to all members and uh, I look forward to working with everyone regardless of which side of the parliament uh, people happen to be sitting on because I think this institution is greater than any of us. Uh, the second deputy speaker the, who continues in that spot, uh, uh, the honourable member for Maranoa has the call yeah. on indulgence. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and thank you for the indulgence. And before we move on to other matters before the House today, can I just say it is a great honour to serve in this place in whatever capacity it is. And I must uh, say, as I've just been uh, re-elected uh, as the second deputy speaker, I want to thank my nominators and thank my colleagues and thank the House. Uh, I think what is always important in these situations is the rule of the democracy under which we all live, and it's important that uh, that is observed. And, and I, I just do thank those who have um, uh, shown confidence in me to continue in this role. I say it's a, been a great honour to serve as the second deputy speaker with the now very humble backbench of the former speaker, the member for Scullin. I've got to say that, Harry, you have um, 
gain not only the respect of this House but the population large across Australia. Uh, wherever I travel, uh, people have become avid watchers of Question Time, uh, and I think it's because you're in the chair. And I think they've registered that you have a great sense of humour. I've had people who comment about, well, the speaker's hair was a bit ruffled today. Were you a bit rough on him? <laughs> but I say that in good humour because that is the humour you have had. You've, you've brought, I think, to, the, to this place a true um, sense of what it means to be uh, fair in all your rulings. And I just thank you for the way that um, your door has always been open to me uh, and, and the way you've served as the uh, Speaker of the House. I've got to say also that that recent visit that we both did, it, did to Western Queensland and to the far reaches of Maranoa, uh, I think it was one of those things. I still get mail from people saying, when are you bringing the speaker back again? Well, maybe you might like to now consider uh, a visit uh, out there again because they, they did respect your visit. They appreciated the time you gave to come uh, as the speaker and the busy role you had there. So I thank you on their behalf as well as my own. Can I congratulate the member for Chisholm as well? Uh, member for Chisholm, I've worked with you before in the last parliament uh, when you were the deputy speaker. Uh, I've certainly appreciated the way that in this parliament you've cooperated uh, and on the speaker's panel. So I respect the work you've done in the past and I certainly look forward to working with you in this parliament. Dear Mr Speaker, can I just congratulate you on this high office that uh, you now hold and I acknowledge uh, the comments you've just made, that your door is open to anyone and the way that you've already indicated that you want to operate as a truly independent speaker. I certainly look forward to continuing to work with you as I have in this parliament when you have been the deputy speaker. I certainly look forward to continuing that relationship and working uh, in this parliament with you as the speaker of the House of Representatives. And I, I thank think, you for the indulgence. I thank the honourable member for Maranoa, the leader of the House on indulgence. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On indulgence, can I congratulate you on your election to high office as the leader of the House? I have worked well with you as the Deputy Speaker and I look forward to continuing to work with you as the Speaker, notwithstanding Mr. Speaker, that I note that so far the scoreboard reads one point of order defeated and none carried. I hope to get the occasional win uh, from uh, my points of order uh, over the years. I also uh, want to note that uh, the 34 occasions that you've reminded the House that I've uh, been excluded from uh, were prior to my holding of this high office of Leader of the House of Representatives. Um, I think, Mr Speaker, that you have demonstrated an ability to chair in an impartial fashion. I have always appreciated the fact that uh, your rulings have been sincere, your knowledge of the parliament and your respect for this great institution of parliament, I think, makes you an ideal candidate for speaker. Can I say to uh, the deputy speaker, Anna Burke, congratulations on your election uh, to high office. You're returning to a position that you held with distinction in the past, and I have no doubt that you will hold it with distinction into the future. To the member for Maranoa, I also congratulate you on your re-election as the second deputy speaker. Uh, you are someone who also I have had the privilege of being welcomed by you into your outstanding electorate, which is very different, of course, from the inner city of Sydney, where I represent. You are someone who brings credit uh, to this parliament by the way that you carry yourself as the member for Maranoa and also as the second deputy speaker and I have the utmost respect for you as a member of parliament. Can I say to the former speaker, uh, Harry Jenkins, um, it is often a difficult job to be manager of opposition business or leader of the House in any parliament and dealing with the speaker. You have had, however, an extremely difficult job to preside over a parliament in which the government has not had an absolute majority in this House. You have done so with integrity. You have done so in a way that has lifted up the standards of this parliament. You, have always, you were always prepared to act as an independent speaker, even in the last parliament. You didn't need a hung parliament to, to know that it was your task to act independently and to uphold the standards in the parliament. I look forward now to being able to have a beer with you as a caucus colleague. It is terrific to welcome you back 
into the Labor family. It is a Labor family in which the name Jenkins is one of the, uh, the most distinguished names that we have had, and I congratulate you on your service to this parliament and look forward to your return as a servant not just of this parliament but of the great party to which I belong. Yeah, yeah.